So, Theo, now the floor is yours. Good morning. Can everybody hear me now? Excellent. Here we are. I thought I was going to wake up like that grumpy cat yesterday, uh, but I opened the curtains, saw the mountains and the, the sun, and started smiling. It was four o'clock in the morning, by the way. And uh, then I turned the TV on, and I've heard that um, our prime minister is finally resigning. Yeah, thank God for that. Um, and then I... Early findings. Pardon? Yes, early findings, exactly. Right, before, before I go to the early findings, I, I feel I need to say um, a few thank yous. Um, and first, um, to Movid. Uh, for organizing this academy and all the partners, the steering group, um, particularly for believing, and I was saying yesterday, whose idea was to collect data during the academy? And I thought, oh, yeah, it was mine. Um, but believing in that idea and investing in that idea, and I hope that what you get today in the next hour or so, um, and then the report, um, you will also feel that it was worth it, because I know it was an additional layer of work that everybody had to do a special thanks to, to the team, to the steering group, um, to all the uh, people who made this happen, um, and to Aidan, my research assistant. He stayed up until one, and then we switched. I woke up at three, and then we carried on. Um, so special thanks to, to Aidan um, as well. Thank you. And on that note, I'll just go straight to, um, to the findings. I'm going to be going back and forth going to remind us a few things, and then I'm going to bring the new data and the new information that we collected during the academy. What I'm also going to do is I'm going to pose three times, and I'm going to open it up for questions and points that you want to make. Okay, So we're going to make it a bit more interactive. I won't be just talking to you for a long time. So be prepared, challenge, challenge each other, because this hasn't finished yet, but also ask questions. So if something is not clear, do ask questions, okay? We thought that this is a good space for all of us to hear each other, because we did a lot of workshops, we did small groups, but this is now an opportunity for all of us to hear each other in a bigger space, okay? So just going back to um, one of the, if you like, mandates of this, of this um, academy was to go back to what the second European Youth Convention um, so as a gap, and it was to develop the constant practice of youth work further to enhance the quality of youth work and innovation. And what was our focus? Current trends, challenges, and innovation in youth work in Europe, yeah? Again, a little reminder of what we've done so far. We've done the literature review. We looked at what other people have said. We had 100 proposals, 36 case studies, then 36 questionnaires on those case studies, qualitative questionnaires. We analyzed the data, we did the background paper, and just to visualize it, these are the countries in the map of Europe uh, where the contributions came from. Yeah, so not, not bad. And I'll come to that in a minute. These are the countries that we covered with the 100 contributions which, as I said, were also analyzed and were reflected in the paper, yeah? But it was so dull until I met you. And this is us. This is the conference. This is the academy. We've covered all these countries. And I've heard different discussions about, oh, but why not this country, and why that not that country, and why didn't you include that country, and why do we have two um, countries from whatever, and da 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 Well, I think one thing that we all have to accept is that there's always limitations, and there's so many countries in Europe. We can have all countries in the academy, but maybe that's something that should be noted for edition number two, or for further research, yeah? When you do research, you do two things if you're a good researcher. First, you identify the gaps, so you accept certain limitations. And then when you finish your research, you say, and my recommendations for strengthening what we said are X, Y, Z. So there are further countries that need to be covered to answer the questions that we addressed. And that's one of the caveats, if you like. But I think overall, 
you look at the map of Europe, and I have to say there's one country missing there, is Egypt, somebody from Egypt, yeah. We had it, but yeah, we couldn't squeeze it in. <laughs> but I said I will mention it because Egypt is there too, yeah. So, you know, when we started this, um, we thought, well, I wish I could fast forward and think whether this is, was all worth it, right? So I'm here, spent a week, left my family. Is it going to be worth it? We know what is so different. We've done, all of us probably, so many events and so many conferences on youth work. Is it going to be worth it? Well, we didn't fast forward in a way, but we did ask you, this is how you felt on day one. So we had, most of you were very reflective. Some satisfied, one unhappy person, a couple of you, three of you bored. But wait, second day, a lot more people satisfied. The unhappy person is still unhappy. Don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> and only four people bored. So on the second day, I think we did quite well. <laughs> and these are some of the words that you said about your reflections. Interesting, inspired, informative, motivated, and so on. So let's go to the more kind of contextual stuff now um, and just remind us the four um, trends. The, we spoke about them again yesterday. Prof professionalization, I can't even say the word, standardization, the blading of sectorial lines, and the transparency and accountability trend. I won't repeat those because we talked about them. So this is what uh, the trends that we or you have identified during the academy. And I know the text is quite small, but don't worry about it. Uh, there are going to be two things after the academy. The presentations will go on the website, not just these presentations. I understand that all presentations will go on the website. And obviously, the report um, will be circulated and will go on the website. Um, and again, a caveat, these are early findings. So we worked um, on, on you know, kind of the headlines instead of the going into the details of it. So all of these things you will get and you'll be able to read them in more detail. So some of the things that you said about trends, um, uh, about culture of ownership, uh, less and less time to do the work, digital trends, there's a lot about digital stuff, yeah? Um, entrepreneurship, especially youth, uh, business ideas, uh, and so on. Um, more, we split, we split it. A lot about games and gamification, you know, people wanting to do young people wanting to learn but have fun at the same time. Online trends, again, it just probably connects with the technology that we talked about, again, about digital stuff. And yes, we asked you again, you know, <laughs> what did you think the trends were? And then you did a different um, survey and you said about capacity building, the need for capacity building. Uh, a lot of impact on communities, which is an interesting point. Um, and it, in, it's kind of in the social trends that we identified, but I think the impact on communities and the consequence of what that means, because some of the uh, literature says that actually that impact on communities creates a knock-on effect, and the communities are rising up. And if you remember, we spoke about the divide between the powerful and the powerless, and as a consequence, you have projects that represent those frustrations and the communities taking over and taking ownership, basically, of youth work and of the issues that they're trying to address. Um, reminder, how did we frame innovation? Um, and we said that innovation is not really a project that you call innovative or you started doing it because you wanted to make it innovative, but is innovative, and sometimes it might even not be called innovative because it's responding to a current need that is challenging and some of the times is unknown. And that can be a local, um, a national or a European need. Um, and this is what you said during uh, the conference about innovation, which is not far from what we started from, which is about adapting to change. So you have change, then you adapt to that change and you respond to it in a different way. Um, is to learn every day from what you see around. You all spoke about learning from young people and as work, youth workers, sometimes that is, is forgotten, uh, but you put a lot of emphasis on, on that. Um, about cultural changes, you, you spoke about cultural changes, and I think by that you didn't mean culture change within your specific environment, but cultural changes across, across Europe, uh, which probably links with the political and the social 
changes that we are experiencing, whether that's nationalism or um, uh, the uh, religion or the uh, need for more ethical values and, and principles, or the lack of um, ethical values and principles. Um, other things that you said is about um, this um, tendency um, when you want to do innovation about building from the past, which is an interesting one because it makes contradiction. You know, how can you be innovating by building on the on the past? But uh, actually, some projects go far before the recent projects, so they go back to the beginnings to traditions, and they go and find traditional um, methodologies. And I think that was a project that used uh, something that I'm very passionate about: the restorative justice approach. So instead of going into kind of adversarial and punitive methods, which is a very recent thing, you go back to the very Aboriginal and the indigenous ways of resolving conflict and bringing people together. So that's another kind of way of becoming innovative by beginning, by going back to the beginning, how we used to do things. And we also spoke about what actually drives innovation. So what innovation itself is, but what actually drives innovation. And there were several things about um, the need for, for funding sometimes, so not so much genuine innovation, um, but um, young people driving that innovation, or the projects uh, themselves, the ideas, the partnerships that you create, um, different, different reasons. I'm not gonna stay um, on this for too long. Um, what issues did we identify now for youth work? So we spoke about what drives innovation and what creates um, these new projects, these new ideas. And we classified them into two, uh, so four, four big groups. Uh, that's the social, we gave different examples, political, the technological, and the financial. Again, I'm not gonna stay on that for too long because we spoke about it. I know this is quite a lot and it's quite big. Uh, uh, this corresponds to those needs, okay? So we discussed what do you think you should see more on this European youth agenda, and some of you stayed um, kind of at a thematic level, so you spoke about, I wanna see more gender equality there, I wanna see more youth-led projects, but some of you spoke about the lack of hope, you wanted more values, you wanted more ethical direction, you wanted more involvement of youth workers, so um, different, different kinds of contribution, different kinds of expectations. Pausing now, and now I'm gonna start making it a little bit more interactive because this is the moment that we've always all, all been waiting for. And yes, we had 102 responses during the academy to the Zoom out questions, of course. So, right, Zoom out question number one, and if you remember, it was split into two, yeah? So those who felt that, just to remind us, for various reasons, youth workers from across sectors often find themselves with no option but to partner with public and profit-making organizations. This trend creates both challenges and opportunities for youth work. Has this impacted on your own work? Explain why if it's a yes and explain no if it's a no. Why if it's a no? So I don't need to explain why we're asking this question, okay? You see, you've seen the trends, you've seen what the uh, challenges are with those trends. And there is no right or wrong answer here. There's no, or those who said yes, it's the right, and those who said no, they're wrong, or the other way around. The purpose here is to understand better the realities that you're facing in your different roles. And I think at the beginning, we put different categories of where you come from. You might be a researcher, a policymaker, a youth worker, and trainer, and so on. To understand your realities so that if this initiative that is called the European Academy of Youth Work has a clearer mandate in going forward. And personally, I've, I've, I've been involved in different events, but this is yet another opportunity to understand and contextualize the realities as they happen now, and then set certain priorities, because when you go to policymakers and you wanna see a change, especially at the European level, if you're not clear in terms of your priorities and you go with a long list of wants most of the times nothing happens, yeah? So you've got to prioritize certain things that make sense to everybody, not to a specific context or a specific country. So if we're finding ourselves or yourselves working in this way and is impacting, 
you and you have answered yes. It has impacted on your work. What we've done, it was a lot of information, by the way. The 101 responses weren't just one line. You put a lot of effort. So uh, many thanks for that. And you know, on, on that note, researchers like me, we take years sometimes to collect data of the amount and quality that we collected over the last three days. So in itself, it's a very unique research project. Yeah, it's, it's very good. It is a, I wouldn't say that, especially online if I didn't know it was a very good research project. So there is a good evidence base there. Don't let it go. And what we had to do last night is to create codes. So we coded it, we categorized it, because it was a lot of information. Yeah. So through qualitative analysis, creating the codes and then putting them into software, and Vivo in particular, um, we created these themes. Okay? And you said, these are the main quotes of the positive responses to the answer, efficiency, innovation brings you together, motivation, yeah, brings you together, visibility, compatibility, money, interference, necessity, no surprises there. And these are the four responses to those who said, no, it doesn't really impact on my work. There's no relevance. I op operate independently anyway, or I'm not interested. That's the kind of the general categories in relation to the, I'm not working with somebody because of this. Okay. And because I like qualitative responses as well, I've just put some of them so that you can contextualize it a little bit. Somebody said, good collaboration with all sectors, but we should have more options in case of co cooperators in different countries. Without partners, it is really difficult to achieve the goal to help the young people and their communities. The red ones are the more negative ones. We end up focusing on being innovative and doing short-term punctual activities instead of quality processes. Youth work has changed as the social circumstances have changed. It shifted them from a civil society engagement into more providing services for young people. It has been driven a lot by employability agenda. It also increased the level of professionalism needed. Youth work controlled by bodies instead of youth workers. It is a top-down approach, and it hinders the quality of youth work. Okay, I'm going to pose a little bit now before I go to the second Zuma question. I'm going to do the same for every Zuma question because I think there is a lot, a lot here, and I would like to get your feedback, your initial thoughts, or questions of clarity or whatever if you want to on this topic, or if you feel strongly about the other things that I mentioned before, about the other things. But if you just look at these quotes, or you know your own findings in terms of the yes or no, I want to get a bit of reaction, a bit of debate going, um, just to get your first, your first feel. Mm -hmm. OK, we, we collect uh, three questions, yeah, three. huh? Hi, and thanks for that. I'm Snežana. I'm <clears throat> primarily a trainer, was a youth worker maybe once. Um, and my, I'm very curious, I don't know if it's a question for you or maybe the people who said that, how can someone be fully independent? Now, um, I am a, I'm a freelance trainer. I think that's more or less as independent that you can get. And still I feel that either of the need or, or will or wish, uh, there is quite a few partnering with different other actors. So this is my, I mean, I'm really curious how can someone be fully independent in this uh, field? OK, um, any other points, questions? Don't be shy. Yeah. We'll take three, and then we'll see how much time we've got. Um, I'm Amr, a freelance trainer as well. But um, what the project did, interference was in the positive slide with the question. So I still I cannot grasp it. So interference is a positive thing from outside of the youth work. Because the question was about money profiting uh, partners. So their interference is a positive impact. I just want to make sure that that's that understood correctly. So basically, so you had a, a, has it impacted or has it not impacted? Those who said, no, it hasn't impacted because it would interfere with my work. Yeah, so I didn't partner, I, I didn't get involved, 
because I felt it would interfere with my work. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Carsten from uh, Germany University. Um, I don't think it is a yes or no, but I think there's a, a red line in between which is very dangerous. So you have to do cooperation, but on one point it may slip somehow. So I know about a project where an, a profession, an uh, economical partner is involved, and at least uh, partners in this pro project are doing translation for him for free for his software. And I think this is a very dangerous part where this cooperation comes to in the end. Okay, I'll give some responses to the, well, you was very straightforward. Um, and if you feel that you wanna respond to your colleagues' points and questions, please raise your hand, and otherwise we'll move on to the second one. Um, in terms of having to work together, obviously, you know, by choice, that's the difference. If you're working in a specific field and you choose where and with whom to work, is one thing. The trend is having no option try to partner with somebody, okay? And that is the difference. Because if you're working in a specific field, and I'm inviting you to think beyond your own work, because there are certain types of work, certain types of youth work that actually might not benefit from working with specific sectors or specific organizations. But what we're finding out is that this partnership working is a forced partnership working. And that is the difference, when you do not have an option. And that creates an issue in itself because partnership is supposed to be, within it, consensual. You know, partnership, consensual. And that brings us to the point of the powerful and the powerless. Who defines those partnerships? And who defines the criteria for those partnerships? That is, and obviously, youth work is all about working together, yeah? But it's how you work together. And what are the terms when you come to the table when working together. And youth workers, the history of youth work, says that the people, the young people, are you, the, you know, the individual, the passionate practitioner who feels that they want to do something in their locality are usually not from a big, powerful organization. Yeah? And that is the caveat, is how you rebalance that power when you do your work in Europe today. Yeah. So when you sit at that table and you're having conversations maybe with your government, maybe with your local authority, maybe you with a European Union body, who is sitting on the other side of that table that you are expected to work with? That is the difference. Yeah. Yes, there are different, as I said, there are different kinds of work in youth work that would raise risks but also avert young people from engaging with youth work if they're done, if they're forced to be done in a specific way or in partnership with specific bodies and organizations. And some of them might not be that affected, but others will be. And the thing with the challenges in relation to technology is that we don't actually know yet what these challenges are because it's so new and every day we're finding out, oh my God, shocking, so many young people bullied and oh my God, they're killing their suicide rates because of online activity and now being recorded. And we didn't know about it. And now you have all these projects about suicides, online suicides of teenagers or of young people. You know, we didn't know about this before. So it's all this, yes, it's great, fantastic stuff, you know, promoting um, you know, different models, but at the same time, certain stuff that come with that, we're not prepared for it. It's like when they first created the credit cards, and it was like, oh my, amazing, I don't have to carry actual money. But then credit card crime started to take place, and there were no laws to put people, you know, in prison because of credit card fraud. And we had to create them. 
So it's kind of, we're not there yet, it's catching up. And I'm just reminding us why we're here. Academies are about identifying the gaps and then you know, trying to resolve those gaps because it's all about the safety of those young people that we're trying to help. You know, it's the safety, the happiness, all those basic things that every young person, every child looks for. Health, safety, and, you know, and to know that they are in good hands. We are the adults. We are the caretakers of those people. And we create all those responses to those current trends, but we sometimes forget that there are gaps in those practices. How much time do I have? I've got two more. I've got time? Maybe one or two more points, because I saw a hand being raised. Okay. Do we have a microphone? Rita? So I'm Rita, I'm working in the German National Agency. For me, you went a bit too quick over a lot of topics. Uh, so, and it was, I know that that's a bit of a pressure. What, why I wanted to say something is that it left a bit of a negative feeling in me because for me that's, yes, I see that there are difficult things going on. We have youth workers who are confronted with political parties that they would not, but it, this is not a question of choice. And for me, the challenge is also what can we do within the field also in European youth work to strengthen youth workers' competences to go into cooperation, which I find are very much needed in, in these societies to go cross borders, to challenge themselves. How can we support youth workers on this and trainers or everybody who is this? Uh, and raising the awareness because I think still people have a choice. Some cases, political situations, you don't have a choice. Business sector, you have a choice. So it's really uh, a question of, of choices to go a bit more specific. Yeah, and that's, that I was a bit... Uh, and I would like to strengthen the, the individual capacity or the professional capacities of youth workers to look on this. What do they need so that we can support them, that they can do something and protect young people from this or find solutions together with them. Yeah, I mean, uh, two, two very quick responses on that. Um, these topics are massive. They are huge. Uh, the chapters and chapters can be written on them and uh, debates over debates just on one topic. You can have an entire conference. Unfortunately for the time, uh, you know, the limited time, we have to speed things up. And that's why I said at the beginning we will have the report, uh, which will be a lot more detailed, but also the presentation and all, you know, the data that you collected. And some of you actually said that. Um, but that depends also on the country. So let's say in Germany or in the UK, uh, there are more options. In Eastern European countries, there are less options, okay? And that is a European panorama, okay? It's not a national um, situation. So I want, you to remind, I want to remind you of that uh, because if we, are, if we are looking for a European youth agenda, all those needs at a political level need to be consolidated in some sort of way. And just to go back to the original mandate, this is about enhancing European youth work so that at your local level and your national level, you can use that as a platform to push it as far as you want to push it because the starting points are not the same. The starting points are very different. So in Germany, the starting point will be different from the starting point in Cyprus or Malta or whatever. Yeah? The, the point here is to have a unified platform on which certain expectations and certain empowerment tools are created, yeah? And of course, that is, is also the case that we've seen in your responses. So depending on where you were coming from, those responses were different, yeah? So now moving on to the second question, uh, which was national and European bodies with a youth work agenda are gradually becoming more demanding in terms of evidencing, yeah? The, um, evidencing the impact of, of youth work including its alignment with professional standards. So that was about spending time on evidence and the standardization of youth work. And we asked whether this has um, impacted on your work, uh, yes or no. So um, those who were positive in terms of the yes, it has impacted, um, you, the, the codes that came out, and again, I'm not, as I said, these are general categories, um, you said it improved the quality of your youth work. Um, others said that um, your youth work became more visible. So by doing that, it, you know, people knew about it. You help, it helped you set goals, goal setting. Um, 
Some of you said more opportunities, actually. So you, you found more opportunities. But when you said, yes, it did impact, it also had some negative uh, impacts, like um, the pressure to do work, um, interference uh, with your work. So the impact wasn't only positive, it was also negative, yeah? Those who said, no, it didn't impact, uh, the, again, again, the general categories, it was um, lack of support for it, so there was no support or it was not relevant at all, uh, lack of knowledge of the topic. Um, and again, I'm going back to that. We all assume that, you know, in all countries in Europe, we know about youth work and that policymakers know about youth work. No, they don't. You know, certain countries might have it as a, you know, the flavor of the month, but certain countries don't, and just people just do it. <laughs> uh, it doesn't exist in your settings. It doesn't exist at all. So, again, some quotes, just to get a bit of more qualitative flavor. Um, some of you said, we use more researchers now working with us, also documenting work uh, more and finding ways to show impact of our work. Uh, the, uh, this uh, positive one is strengthens your work youth work and contributes to knowledge building. Some negative ones, uh, youth work controlled by bodies instead of youth workers is a top-down approach that hinders quality. It gives us more administrative work and puts, away, puts us away from young people. It's time consuming. Mostly the results are wanted in numbers, but numbers don't tell the truth. Uh, we get lost in administrative stuff and reporting and have less time to actually impact. There was a lot more, obviously, but it's along those lines, and you get the feel. You know, you're know, asking about evidence, some of you feel, yeah, it's good, it's making it visible, we work with other people, the measures are impact, but at the same time, you know, we're spending so much time filling out forms, it takes us away from young people. You know, and sometimes when we have to put numbers, actually they're not the real numbers, because we have to get the funding. So, um, yeah, mixed responses. As I said, it's not a right or wrong answer is the measurement of your realities, and these are your realities today. Comments, reflections, or questions? Maybe from There's one there, there two, three there. I'm Darko uh, from Grassroot Organization from, from Germany. Um, I see the desire and the um, positive sides, but like I also see the negative sides. So, for example, each year we're talking about less administration, but actually it gets more. Uh, like if you do comparative analysis of how the applications were looking like, like three, four years ago, there are actually more questions, but we're talking about less questions. Um, the amount of documentation that we have to do, for example, uh, we want to include more young people with, with fewer opportunities, uh, but we have to identify them. You know, like we have to click which are under the name of the people. You know, like so we're talking about, yes, we want to make a bigger impact, but like the question is how? And then this has a ripple effect down the line of the people who implement it because the, the youth organizations now are asking, when we're sending young people abroad, they're asking, please tell us which are with fewer opportunities and what kind of fewer opportunities do they have? And this is from the pressure to identify which and how and to document. So I want to make everyone aware of what is happening on the ground because um, the trends that are happening, like my impression, and we spoke yesterday a little bit, they're on technocratic, level and then not so much on on actual implementation another thing is that like we want to include young people into the processes to give them like for example the the narrative has changed into the whole application phase how do young people prepare themselves uh, for going on a youth exchange for example but what kind of skills do they have like to prepare themselves so without supervision of, of youth workers? I don't mind, like don't get me wrong. Like I'm, I'm all for young people being more involved, but like there is how and when and, and why, you know, like and this is something that we, we should pay much more attention. And then the trend should go into that direction, into qualitative improvement, rather than like putting like I believe more work for us and and, and more time. And I agree with the comments that you made. So. Thank you. 
Uh, good morning to everyone. My name is Marco, and I'm here on behalf of the research community. So I'm going to talk from the point of view of the research community. Well, from my point of view, I believe that by you know putting emphasis of evidencing, basically, research community got the bigger impact on developing youth youth work agenda as such. Because I mean, if you take a look at the all the aspects of the sector, youth sector as such, for instance, participation, youth inclusion, health, there are lots of research you know covering this area of work. However, with the uplift of the and the emphasize of the evidencing, basically youth work has been put on the agenda of the research community as such. And this is something that is quite positive when it comes to, you know, just um, uh, insisting on uh, providing evidence because, you know, for the first time, I mean, youth work, there are lots of initiatives within research community that are starting to investigate and study youth work as such, not necessarily focusing exclusively on young people. So from my point of view, I believe that when it comes to the like, synergy between civil, civil, civil society and research community, putting the emphasis on evidencing basically produced this synergy in utmost. So thanks. Um, hello, my name is Katharina, and I'm also coming from Germany. And I just wanted to add um, that all this administrative work and all this reporting and application and stuff, and also maybe it's connected to this thing with um, that we need to have a partnership like with foundations or public bodies. It's also about exclusion, not only of the of the young people and the people that have like not so the background of European education stuff but also for smaller organizations. I think there are a lot of really cool small organizations that are doing really innovative work also in rural areas. But for them, this is like an excluding factor because it's like so much work and it's also really scary. If you want to write a key action too, you have like, I don't know, to write 60 pages. And I think a lot of small, really cool organizations are not even trying to do that <laughs> because it's like, I don't know. Yeah, that's just what I want to do. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So I, I have a fear that may be personal, but I don't know if it's common, but also we are very bad lobbyists. I mean, it's good that uh, youth work is a keyword that is coming more in the EU youth strategy and things like that. But for example, last week I was talking with former participants from international project and they were asking me, so what happens in the Council of Europe that uh, without Russia we cannot pay the youth department? And then we see the campaign that some youth organizations are doing and it's not only being uh, cut for the youth department, also for education and many more things, but we don't talk about that. We focus only on ourselves. So this is also not so nice. I talk with some uh, youth workers here about Erasmus Plus and national agencies, and they say about countries where they know that it's impossible to ask for funding because the national agencies are not funding them, like it can be Spain, it can be Bulgaria, it can be Italy, many others. I mean, we are the youth workers, and we know that the people that are making the policies, giving us the funding and doing things for us are not doing it in the way that we believe it's the one that we would like. So we are the ones doing also something wrong probably there. And then connected to international youth work, I wonder if there is also the problem that we are not using international youth work as an added value for supporting the young people in our local realities, but you are using uh, international youth work for making money. And then it, we are also not really supporting quality if what we are trying to do is not supporting the young people but paying our salaries. Thank you. And it's good to hear, it's very refreshing to hear honest uh, statements. Um, and I wouldn't say you're back lobbyists. Um, and when you say you, I'm assuming you mean youth workers or those working in the youth field, right? I would say you're just very busy people and you generally do your job you know, working on the front line, you know, trying to train people or work with young people. The question is whose job is it to take your realities, document it, and then influence what needs to be influenced? And there's two more bridges there. So that's the bridge of the researcher taking your realities, and then that's the bridge with the researchers, with the policymakers, to improve your reality. So I see three bridges being need to be built between the practitioners, the trainers, all those working on the front line, the researchers, helping them to document without diverting their very precious time of saving lives, working with young people, do all those things, but also not being asked to do something that A, they're not interested in, they don't know how to do, and you know why would they be doing it? 
And then the researchers learning to work better with policymakers, but also the other way around. Policymakers learning to work better with the researchers, and the researchers learning to work better and entrusting relationships with their practitioners. Because us researchers have betrayed practitioners many times. And that's why practitioners are very skeptical when they open the door to researchers to come into their projects with young people who might be facing all sorts of challenges. And youth work is very confidential work. Most of the times happens behind closed doors. How do you open those doors to the researchers to support your work and then work with the policymakers? It's a very difficult relationship to strike balance, but it's not impossible. And I'm going back to why we're here, because we want to bridge those, those gaps. Yeah? And it's not impossible to bridge those gaps. And I'll give you at least one example from where I come from. Um, where I come from, anyway. I'm Greek, but I live in London. I'm a Greek Londoner. Anyway, but I'm talking about the UK, which is what I know. So there's been a lot of discussions over the last 10 years about uh, funding and about small organizations getting funding. And um, we felt, being in that sector, that something needs to change. And we felt something similar that you're feeling that cannot be changed. Well, it did. And what we kept doing, we did two things. Campaigning. So campaigning is... Sometimes meaning, and if I just take it to the you know, very rough notion of campaigning and you think of race equality, it's just literally going down the street with a banner, blocking the roads and campaign, or do online campaigning or whatever it is. And evidence-based policy, collecting evidence and taking it to people who need to change what need to change. And as a result, what we ended up with was two things. If the project was small, then the funders whether that was an independent trust or a government body, had from that point and onwards, and they had agreed, to not make long, complicated applications, but have them small, very small, for those projects who do not have the capacity to a, articulate what they need to say in a very complicated way, but very quickly fill out that form, whether it's online or on paper, and get the five or 10,000 pounds that they all need, that's all they need and then just go away and have a very simple monitoring system to report back. Okay, that was the first achievement. The second achievement, it was the expectation for the big ones when you want the evidence to partner with the right organization. So if you are a frontline youth worker and you are applying for 100,000 or 200,000 pounds to run a project, you're expected to find a research partner to do your evaluation and not be expected as a youth worker when you're doing it to also collect data from whatever you're doing. And that made a huge difference. Okay? It was only two things that had to change. And uh, it, it has helped so much those little projects to take off the ground whatever they wanted to achieve, but also the big projects to be evaluated. So it's not impossible. I'm conscious of time, so I will move on to the third Zuma question. Do you think that setting a larger European framework for the youth work agenda help the development of youth work in your context? What should be part of that agenda? Yeah, so it's now taking it to, to the wider European level of the, basically what you're doing. And those who said, yes, who said more support, well, more support, more outreach, shared knowledge, shared values, shared goals, new legislation, more opportunity, yeah? And those who say no, um, difference in infrastructure, different values, that's a very interesting one. Not enough support, unsure about it, has no value, different social context, depends who runs it. And some qualitative quotes, the agenda needs to include youth from neighboring countries. That's an interesting one, because I haven't seen it a lot. So. And the context of that was that we need to learn more. And I'm, I'm assuming it wasn't just you from Egypt. There <laughs> was other people who said that. Recognition measures and more focus on specific resources dedicated to reach the agenda aims. Uh, the European framework should define roles of youth work institutions and organizations, as well as the role of youth worker to support the recognition of youth work. The European framework should support youth pilot projects more and should make a framework for youth-led projects. And I'll come to that in a minute. And this, uh, the two in red were interesting. I believe that having youth workings instead of other professionals deciding a youth work framework would support the field. And the second one is very similar. The important is who makes the framework 
and which is the methodology and process for it. Youth workers involved instead of people from the commission with economic background and people with no connection with urban and rural youth. Um, so <laughs> the two red ones is basically signifying that, well, actually, you got the wrong people doing it. So I'm not sure, you know, that the whole premise is, is correct. So more youth workers there. Some of you said more, more young people. These are the realities. Because if you have the economic experts and the people from the European Commission who, and I'm not, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, who live in the high ivory towers, you know, what a good youth agenda is that kind of thing. Um, the other kind of more positive um, um, comments were, we want more of this, you know, the agenda needs to be more inclusive of youth. It has been criticized for reaching the usual suspects already, so it's been improved in that respect, or hopefully will be improved in that respect. Um, the interesting one is a few of you um, use the term youth-led, and that um, it makes me very happy to hear that because I'm, I'm very passionate about this youth-led and what youth-led is, and whether that term um, <coughs> gets to be hijacked. So that's the the, um, the expectations in terms of youth, uh, youth, uh, European youth agenda, and there, trust me, there were a lot more. But obviously, these are things that when the third convention takes place, I would assume there are gaps and there are expectations that probably we'll need to respond to. And the report will have a lot more in terms of what you have identified through your realities that this European youth agenda needs to include. I think we have a few more minutes for um, some final comments and questions. So, far away. We exhausted our, your minds. I think, well, we'll, we'll leave it there, because I think, I don't know if we've got a break or uh, something to, no, we're go, going to get in, into more discussions. So, um, just on a, on a final note, I just want to say uh, thank you for participating in the uh, active and, you know, ongoing research. I know it wasn't easy, because, you know, when you have to do a workshop, uh, listen, network, figure what is going on, complete the questions, come to the plenaries, go to the social activities, you're away from home, it's a lot. So it's something for me to learn because it, it, blame it on me, all these research questions. Um, uh, I, it's the first time I actually introduced so many things into one space, uh, but I think, it, it, as far as I, I hope at least, it was worth it. And um, there will be a panel after this one because probably thinking back of your head. So we put a lot of work here. You put a lot of work. Everybody's put a lot of work. Where are we going to go with this? Um, and there will be a panel after this, which hopefully will give you more clarity around that. And I'm not the right person to answer that question. Um, I'm the middle person, remember, with Bridges? I'm in the middle. So there's another, another group. Um, and you are the other group. Kind of. <laughs> so uh, make, make sure you, uh, you go home and you feel, um, first of all, that you know, you, your, your time was well spent. At least I feel that my time was well spent. Um, and that you have time, something to take back. And you know, we were arguing yesterday, you know, the facilitators, me, and in a good way, arguing. You know, well, what, what, how, how do we stimulate your thinking when you go back that there's one or two things that you're going to change? And that's not for us to, to say, you know, it's for you to, to say, and you might change, you know, I'm going to go back and change my sink because it's been dripping. Uh, but, you know, I'm not going to be able to, ch to check that, right? Um, it's up to you whether you feel that something has to change in the way that you do your work, but also how you communicate with other people so that we all benefit from it. And when I say all, I don't just mean people in your country, but in Europe. So thank you very much for bearing with uh, the questions and for helping with the research. And I hope uh, you go back home, hopefully, safely. Thanks.